Okay, so um, we begin with the lecture 37 here. Uh, perhaps this is the last lecture on X-ray diffraction, uh, which is a technique to characterize the crystals as we have seen in past few lectures. So what we have learned so far in, in X-ray diffraction is uh, the origin of X-rays, what is diffraction and then X-ray diffraction in crystals. which is uh, um, characterized by, which is uh, expressed by n lambda is equal to 2 d h k l sin theta, which is Bragg's law. And then we looked at the uh, methods of diffraction, methods of characterizing uh, samples such as uh, we looked at single crystal and single crystals and polycrystalline samples, powder specimens, right, slash polycrystalline samples. And then finally, in the last class, we, look, we looked at uh, the extinction conditions, which are determined by the type of crystal structure, whether it is a FCC, BCC or simple cubic lattice. So, what we saw was in the last lecture that if you have if you have a simple cubic structure, then all H k L are permitted. If it is B C C structure, then H plus K plus L must be even for diffraction to, to occur. Okay. and H plus K plus L odd will means no diffraction from those planes. And then we looked at FCC structured materials from which uh, uh, for diffraction to occur H K L must be unmixed which means all even or all odd or so this will allow the diffraction will occur and if h k l are mixed no diffraction will occur okay and we did a simple analysis as well. So, where we took a table of thetas, so we took a table of th table of Bragg angles which we converted into sin square thetas and those sin square were thetas were converted because we know that sin square theta is proportional to h square plus k square plus l square. As a result and h square plus h square, h square plus k square plus l square must be integer, right. So, we converted the sin square thetas into integers and we found that if it matches uh, the sequence. So, we know that uh, for simple cubic, uh, simple cubic h square plus k square plus l square must go as. So, if you look at the variation of h square plus l, k square plus l square for simple cubic, for BCC and for FCC. So, if you look at h k l plane, you, if you start with 1 0 0, then this is 1, then simple cubic it diffracts, B C C it does not diffract, F C C it does not diffract. So, when you go to 1 1 0, h square plus k square plus l square is 2 and your simple cubic in that case will diffract, B C C will diffract, but F C C will not diffract. And when you go to for example, uh, 1 1 1 h square plus k square plus l square is 3, simple cubic will diffract, BCC will not diffract, FCC will diffract. And that you keep on doing this 2 0 0, this will be 4, 
this will diffract, this will diffract but and this will diffract and that is how you keep on working and uh, you will then, so you convert your sin square theta in such a fashion so that you are able to uh, match to one of these. So, the sequence for this would be 1, 2, 3, 4 and so on and so forth, for this would be 2, 4, 6, 8 and so on and so forth and for this it would be 3, 4, uh, 8 so on and so forth. So, that is how you keep working on it and that is how you characterize the crystals. Okay. Now, if I uh, now in this lecture what I want to talk to you about is what is the use of x-ray diffraction, what kind of structural characterization one can do using x-ray diffraction. So, we, we are looking at applications of x-ray diffractions, if diffraction So, x-ray diffraction can be used for uh, first you can use it for phase identification then you can use it for determination of crystal size of crystal size determination of strain lattice strain can be determined and one can determine the crystal quality one can also determine the texture and one can determine there are a lot of other things you can do using x-ray diffraction. For example, one can determine what is the uh, crystal quality, texture, crystal size, strain, lattice, uh, one can also determine atomic positions for instance. Uh, but these are all advanced, uh, um, so this is I would say this is you know advanced version. And these are all more um, um, you can say beginner level of uh, expertise. So, let me just talk to you a few things about x-ray diffraction which you might find useful for practical purposes. So, when you when you have a polycrystalline let us say sample, so this is you know powder and your beams are hitting the samples in this fashion. So, this will be transmitted beam with respect to transmitted beam you will have something going at this 2 theta, there will be some beams going at this 2 theta. So, so there will be beams going at all the different 2 thetas because it is a polycrystalline specimen. As a result the x-ray diffraction pattern that you will get is something like that. So, this will give rise to a pattern which is achieved in this fashion. So, on y axis you plot in intensity which is in arbitrary units and the x axis you form 2 theta which is in uh, typically in degrees which is the angle between the transmitted beam and the diffracted beam and the pattern is something like this. and so on and so forth. So, for example, if it was FCC crystal this would be your first peak will be 111, second would be 200 and then you will have 220 and so this would be 311, this would be 222 and so on and so forth. That is how you will get a extra diffraction pattern for a FCC crystal. If it was a BCC crystal it would be different as per the extinction conditions. What we observe normally in a x-ray diffraction pattern of a real crystal is that that ideal x-ray diffraction means n lambda. So, ideality requires n lambda is equal to 2 d sin theta which means we must have the value at fixed theta. Okay. So, the ideal crystal if you if you plot intensity for a given peak as a function of so, this is i this is 2 theta for an ideal crystal I must have a single peak a very sharp line because of because this angle is fixed. Okay. So, this is Bragg angle since it is fixed because of this Bragg relation there must be a single peak. 
So, this is 2 theta b. However, in reality what we observe is behavior like this, which is sort of a Gaussian or Lorentzian or mixed relation. Uh, it can be fitted to Gaussian or Lorentzian, but uh, a mixed function of Gaussian Lorentzian, but this is what you observe. So, this is your you can say ideal behavior and this is your real observation. So, what this tells you is that within these two bounds of 2 theta 1 and 2 theta 2, you have a peak which shows a maxima at around 2 theta b and this peak has certain width which is called as uh, delta theta or theta or or b the broadening. Okay. Now, this is this non ideal behavior uh, or you can say non ideal behavior. This non ideal observation is because of uh, non idealities in the in the x-ray diffraction, the deviations from idealities. So, those deviations in the idealities could be uh, uh, variations in lambda, very tiny variations in lambda, tiny variations in uh, you can have because of crystal size. Crystals, if the crystal size is very small, then the destructive interference at other theta values. So, so this is the theta value theta at theta b. We have constructive interference, right? If the peak is diffracting, and at theta not equal to theta b within the vicinity, you should have destructive interference. Right. However, if the destructive interference is not complete because of size effects, because if the crystal is not thick enough to give you complete destructive interference, then what you will have is you will not have complete suppression of intensity, rather you will have mild suppression of intensity. As a result, you will get some finite intensity at theta, theta values which are slightly off from theta b. So, if you have theta b plus or theta b minus it will have incomplete destructive interference and this in incomplete inter indestructive interference increases as your crystal size decreases. So, what you will see normally is that your the peak uh, if you if you draw the intensity versus uh, to theta. So, i to theta the peak for a very thick crystal would be something like that, but whereas it for a for a crystal whose which is of small sized which has smaller grain size. So, this is for instance for a for a, a coarse grained material. Okay. Whereas, the same for a um, so this would be for a fine grained material. The peak will be centered at around theta b. So, this will be centered at theta b. However, the degree of broadening uh, so, you can say this broadening and this broadening in this case they are different. So, th so delta theta or b for a fine grained material is larger than delta theta or b for a coarse grained material and this is characterized by uh, a relation called as uh, the crystal size T is characterized by 0 0.9, 0 0.9 lambda divided by B cos theta B, where lambda is the wavelength 
B is the full width half maximum which is in radians okay. and theta B is the Bragg angle in degrees okay. and this is your wavelength in uh, you can say meters or whatever nanometer. Or. So, this will give you the T which is called as crystallite size. So, your higher broadening will mean a smaller crystallite size. So, your fine grained material will give you higher broadening and your coarse grained will material, material will give you smaller broadening. However, every instrument also has instrumental broadening. So, even if you have a single crystal, it will have some broadening okay, which is because of the instrument. So, this must, so the real B will be B observed minus B instrument. So, one must always do an experiment with a coarse grained sample which is the reference sample which is used to measure the instrumental broadening. So, this is on measured on a on a standard coarse grained sample and this is your on the sample that you want to measure that you want to analyze. Okay. So, this is very important that you carry out the subtraction of instrumental broadening otherwise the estimation of broadening or estimation of grain size may be wrong. Okay. So, most people make a mistake in this uh, analysis. Second thing what you can do is that the strain that is when you have second thing which x-ray diffraction can give you is about the strain. So, this is about the previous thing was about the particle size you can say particle size or you can say crystallite size. Okay. It can give you also an idea about the strain. So, if you have a crystal um, which has lattice spacing like this. So, this is let us say the equilibrium D, right. If the crystal has a uniform strain, let us say it has a uniform strain where the D has increased a little bit. So, this is your D1. So, this is no strain, this is uniform strain uniform strain. So, this is let us say D 1 and D 1 is greater than D and correspondingly you have a strain which is D 1 minus D naught divided by D naught. Okay. And then you have non uniform strain for example, you can it can be bent crystal like this okay, where you can have smaller spacing here let us say it's, it varies like this. So, this is a case of non uniform strain and what you will observe in x-ray diffraction in this case. Uh, so, if I just remove this strain word from here and just write it here uniform strain and if I now make a plot of, so let us say this is my 2 theta, this is the second 2 theta and this is the third 2 theta. So, this is intensity axis and this is 2 theta for all of them. Okay. And if I choose a particular peak, the particular peak let us say the this is the equilibrium 2 theta B. So, this will show you a shift. Uh, so, this will show you a peak which is something like that. If you have a uniform strain, the uniform strain will allow this peak to be shifted. 
So, in this case d has increased which means theta will decrease this will be centered like this. So, this is theta b prime which is so theta b prime is lower than theta b original okay, because the peak is slightly shifted, shifted to left because of increase in the d parameter. Okay. Now, when you have non-uniform strain which means you have multiple d's now. So, what it means is that non-uniform peak will lead to higher broadening. So, a non-uniform peak will lead to more broadening. So, this is B R O A D E N I N broadening. So, this broadening uh, let us say this is this broadening is characterized as B which is basically delta 2 theta and this is essentially equal to minus of 2 delta D divided by D into tan theta. This can be just obtained by differentiating the equation lambda is equal to 2D sin theta. Okay. So, this is the strain determination that you can do for quantification of strain you need to use what we call as Williamson Hall method. used for quantification of strain and also since non-uniform strain leads to broadening, particle size effect also leads to broadening you need to distinguish between the two. Okay. So, it turns out so the overall broadening beta square if I express this as b or b or beta uh, uh, let us say beta in this case then this overall broadening beta square is represented as point line lambda divided by b cos theta b plus 4 epsilon tan theta square plus beta naught square. So, this is overall broadening. Okay. So, here this, this term is because of size, this term is because of strain and this is because of instrument. So, what I need to do that is here is so basically what I need. Uh, so, uh, if I so essentially it is essentially what I need to do is that I need to plot uh, in this case I can just make I can make slight modifications the modifications lead to uh, so beta because of uh, uh, beta let us say crystallite size is uh, k lambda divided by t cos theta b okay this is because of crystallite size and the other term which is because of broadening the beta s which is because of strain sorry c epsilon tan theta which is a strain and here c is the constant okay so beta net happens to be beta measured which is because of size and minus of beta instrument so it turns out that beta net is equal to c epsilon tan theta plus k lambda divided by t cos theta and if I um, so this is and, and minus beta naught of course. So, this is beta naught if I take this uh, so this value I would know okay, beta naught I can measure right by measuring a standard specimen. So, what you do now here is so, this becomes beta net 
cos theta is equal to c epsilon and this will become sin theta plus k lambda divided by t minus beta instrument cos theta which I can measure. So, this is a term which is a known term. Okay. So, this is a known term. So, what I do now is that I plot basically. So, this is a simple linear equation. I plot uh, essentially beta uh, net cos theta as a function of uh, sin theta. So, what I can do here is I can just uh, take this on this side. So, this will become beta observed plus beta. Uh, so, this is sorry this is beta observed, this is beta net, beta net plus beta instrument into cos theta right. This will become equal to C epsilon sin theta plus K lambda divided by T and this term is known term right instrument into cos theta. So, if I now plot beta cos theta as a function of uh, and sin theta, I should get a sort of straight line for various theta values. Let us say these are the theta values I will see right. Okay. So, the slope of this equation will be equal to C epsilon and the intercept will be equal to k lambda by t. So, this effect is particle size and this is strain. So, this method is called as called as uh, so this method is called as Williamson uh, we can write it as some other color may be Williamson Hall method to evaluate strain and particle size in polycrystalline specimens. The strains could be because of processing strain, it could be uh, could be phase transformation induced strain, it could be any kind of strain basically it could be impurity induced strain. So, it is not necessary that they are always correct? No. So, for example, if you deform a crystal, heavily deformed crystal will have lot of strain, but if you anneal it, a strain will go away. Okay. So, if you do for example, recovery, recrystallization or grain growth depending upon what temperature to which you heat the material, it will have different levels of strain. So, this is the methodology for analyzing crystals using x ray diffraction, where we can analyze um, uh, crist um, the, the particle size and the strain. So, when you when you have x ray diffraction pattern from different materials, if you plot, so you will see intensity 2 theta, a, a, a crystal, a crystalline material will give you a structure like this, okay, very sharp peaks. So, sharp peaks will mean crystalline material okay. and the peak width will give you the differences in the grain size and so on and so forth. If you have a pattern like this in which you have uh, I versus 2 theta, you have very broad hump like that. This will mean or you have very small if you start from very low angle very broad hump like that. So, the first one corresponds to typically gases, okay. they do not diffract, they, they just show you a broad hump and this is from a liquid like phases such as glasses. right? So, glasses will show you a structure which will show you a hump at low angles. So, on the if you have if you have bit of swelling on the low angle side in the x-ray diffraction pattern, you know that your material has amorphous content. So, you might have a x-ray diffraction pattern which has a hump on the low angle side, but it has peaks on the high angle side, then it has a mixture of crystalline and amorphous phases in the uh, in the same material. 
and one can also do analysis of single phase uh, analysis of phases in the XC diffraction pattern. So, um, I will uh, and one can also determine texture and other things which probably I will not be able to complete in this course. If you are interested to know more about the, 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 the details of X-ray diffraction, I would recommend that you go through BD quality um, elements of X-ray diffraction. It is a very good book on X-ray diffraction for beginners. Okay. So, you can do all the uh, reading there for understanding the advanced uh, use of X-ray diffraction. Let me show you one picture of uh, modern X-ray diffractometers, how they look like. So, your modern X-ray diffractometers look like this. So, this is for example, a panalytical X-ray diffractometer where this is a sample holder. The, so, so, let me just use a pen. So, this is the sample stage. This is the source and this is the detector. So, sample, so this, so your beam, so in this case what might be happening is that your beam may be coming at a fixed angle and this might be rotating and this might be rotating, okay. these two uh, and the sample may also rotate within the plane, so it may also rotate within the plane. So, these are uh, typically one circle or two circle diffractometers, okay. so there is only one circle of rotation which is this, in this circle sample as well as diffractometer rotate. There could be second uh, rotation in this plane, but that could be absent. In more advanced diffractometer, you have a diffractometer like this, which is which has four circle diffractometer. So, you have sample rotating within this plane, you have the cradle rotating within. So, this is phi, this is psi and then your machine can 2 theta rotates in this, this is 2 theta and then your sample and then uh, uh, so, the sample itself can rotate uh, within this plane. So, this is 2 theta plane, sample can also rotate along its own axis. Uh, uh, so, this is omega. So, you can have within the, so you can have omega, you can have 2 theta. So, omega is used for rocking curve, omega is basically half of 2 theta. Okay. So, this is used for rocking curve analysis. So, if you want to do texture analysis, for example, you need to use all these four angles 2 theta, omega, phi, and Psi. This is sample rotation within, uh, per, so if you, so sample may be tilted in some direction, but it is rotating along its sample normal. So, if it rotates al around its sample normal, then it is phi, but if your sample is like this and if it goes like this, this is, om this is uh, omega, if it goes like this, then this is psi and 2 theta is just, this is omega, but 2 theta is mean the detector rotating like this. So this is to theta. So, if your sample is, so this is your sample. So, if sample is ro rocking around its own axis, this is omega, but you have a detector which is here and detector and this is your x-ray beam. So, if these two rotate together, then this is 2 theta. So, you can see that omega and 2 theta are co coplanar, okay. but you have phi and psi which are different. So, all right. So, phi if you look at the sample from top and sample rotates, so this is the top view, this is phi and psi would be if you look at the sample uh, on the other direction, this is my sample. So, and if I tilt it uh, around this axis, then it is psi. Okay. So, these are the four angles of rotation that you might have in a diffractometer. So, basically X-ray diffraction is a useful technique for structure determination, phase identification which I have not done. Phase identification is done by peak matching okay, with respect to standard files uh, and uh, you can also use a lot of softwares using this. It can also do crystallite size measurement, you can do strain and stress measurement, texture determination, many other applications you can do which are advanced application for which you need advanced understanding of X-ray diffraction. Okay. So, we will close this lecture here with which we close X-ray diffraction and the next lecture we will start about the defects in the solids which will come and next three lectures will complete the course uh, altogether. Okay.